Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland, and this video is uh, a review of A Very English Scandal by Paul Preston. And there you can see on the front cover is Jeremy Thorpe, who is the main character, perhaps I can call it, of this book, because it is a uh, factual book. However, it reads like a fast-paced thriller. And Thorpe is there wearing his uh, trademark brown Homburg hat, um, perhaps a symbol of his uh, Europhilia, a hat from the continent. And there you can see the silhouette of the um, Houses of Parliament, because Jeremy Thorpe was, of course, um, a well-known MP, sometime leader of the Liberal Party. So it was a very lively uh, book, and um, uh, Preston uh, is a political journalist, and he brings all his uh, skills as the consummate Westminster correspondent uh, to this tale, oh, subtitled Sex, Lies and a Murder Plot in the Heart of the Establishment. So um, Preston doesn't bore the reader by looking at the whole of Thorpe's life. He was born in 1929 and he was called to the great big uh, debating chamber in the sky in December 2014. So Preston focuses on the years 1961 to 79. And these are the years of, of, of Thorpe's ill-starred involvement with a certain um, Norman um, Joseph, later he called himself Norman Scott. Um, and notably, he relates the story in the present tense to bring immediacy uh, to the narrative. So picture the scene in 1961 when Jeremy Thorpe uh, was uh, 32 years of age, a member of parliament for North Devon. He's part of the uh, Liberal Party. And um, every election seems to be a near-death experience for the Liberal Party, which is very close to becoming extinct as a parliamentary species. They've only got six members of parliament out of 650. As people quipped, they could fit all the Liberal MPs into in a phone box or a mini. So Thorpe was renowned for his exceptional oratorical gifts and being a fantastic wit. Uh, he's a debater who cut his teeth at the Oxford Union, had been called to the bar, so Thorpe was the son and grandson of Tory MPs. Uh, had he chosen to be a Conservative, he would have been guaranteed a safe Tory seat. However, ever the attention seeker, perhaps contrary and all the rest of it, he chose to be a Liberal. It was very much swimming against the tide. He appeared to be a compulsive gambler, not on the playing tables, that would have been rather safer, but certainly a mischief maker, a man out to make his mark. So the many um, extroverts and exhibitionists go into politics, but they have bedrock beliefs. I think Thorpe did too, actually. Um, he was certainly a principled anti-racist. So Thorpe comes across as once genial and quixotic in these pages, and I think the um, uh, pen portrait of him here captures it right. Um, how he's uh, silver-tongued, a not very serious uh, barrister, certainly no jurisprudential um, scholar, and um, his own um, private life would be violative of the notion of the rule of law. Uh, he also had uh, an incredible knack for mimicry and uh, a, a gift for remembering people's names so could make his constituents feel that he cared about them when, of course, he didn't give a damn about them. So he was a, a um, showman, a sort of gay Tony Blair. Um, he was a winsome Machiavelli, Jeremy Thorpe, and amoral in his personal life, whereas he was principled in politics. Um, so there was an aspect of Thorpe's personal life he chose to keep quiet. He was a Ganymede since his school day, days at Eton and um, had homosexual liaison, liaisons at Oxford. But anyway, 1961, he's on the brink of great things. Thorpe stays with a friend, some of the countryside. He meets a 21-year-old stable boy, Norman Joseph. Thorpe later wrote that the Joseph looked simply heaven. So, uh, well, actually, like Thorpe, Joseph was half Irish, half English. Um, anyway, Joseph was a highly unstable character, prone to flights of fancy, and he began an intimate relationship with Thorpe. Their physical relationship lasted only a few months. However, it was to haunt Thorpe till his dying day. Norman uh, Joseph, also known as Norman Scott, is still alive and still milking this uh, physical uh, liaison he had with Thorpe way back in the early 60s. Um, so to Thorpe, I think it really was just physical gratification from this, and there are detailed, indeed, graphic accounts of this, because um, Joseph later went to the police about it. Remember, until 1967, in England, Wales, uh, sexual relations between two males was a crime, no matter what their age. But if one of them was under 21 and the other was over 21, the older party would be judged to have corrupted the younger man, and the older party was going to prison. If they're both over 21, they both go to prison. 
but as I say, if it was man over 21 had seduced a man below that age, the older one was going to prison for a long time. Um, anyway, so Thorpe, he uh, cast aside Joseph. He was a mere plaything, but uh, Joseph uh, took this very badly indeed, being jilted. So Norma Joseph went to the police and confessed uh, his unlawful intercourse with Thorpe. But the, the police in those days were in the habit of very much tugging the forelock to the squirearchy. Um, so they didn't even put the allegation to Thorpe, as though this was a fel felony. So Joseph was mentally ill, as the book details. He was in and out of psychiatric hospitals. He made a number, number of parasuicidal gestures. He drifted from one job to, an, uh, to another in England, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Switzerland, and so on, uh, as an ostler, as a model. He was tall, uh, slender, with saturnine, brooding, good looks. Um, being uh, skinny and soulful was at the height of fashion. And then there was this thing about the national insurance card. In the United Kingdom, you have to pay your national insurance, as in that would help pay for unemployment benefit and so on, as well as taxes, a thing called national insurance. And he was forever losing it and claiming that Jeremy Thorpe had to get him one and Jeremy Thorpe would claim to be his employer or his guardian at one point, though Thorpe's uh, interest in this young man was anything but avuncular. So Thorpe farmed out this problem of Norman Joseph to Paul Bessel, a fellow Liberal MP who sat for the Bodmin constituency. So Bessel sent regular retainers because Thorpe wanted to distance himself from uh, Norman Joseph uh, because um, he didn't want there to be written evidence suggesting that he'd had an intimate relationship with Norman Joseph. So the book is, is, is good at detailing this and perhaps it's mired in excessive detail at times. And there were various attempts to get Joseph out of the country, get Norman Joseph a job overseas, but the cat came back the very next day. So 1966, Joe Grimmond, another old Etonian leader of the Liberal Party, stood down from that party with half a dozen MPs, and uh, Jeremy Thorpe was elected leader of the Liberal Party. He was 37 and appeared to be on a very high trajectory. Um, and he also enjoyed most cordial relations with the uh, Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. Wilson had been a a liberal in, in his Oxford days, and I suppose he saw the Liberal Party was moribund, he joined Labour. Uh, it'd be much the same story for Michael Foote, who was a standard bearer of the far left in the Labour Party, son of a Liberal MP, no doubt. So um, Thorpe had reached his late 30s, and he had never been seen um, uh, um, expressing any romantic interest in a lady. So unsurprisingly, questions were asked of his orientation. Remember, uh, attitudes towards uh, same-sex relations were decidedly negative in those days. And so whispers of Norman Joseph's allegations had reached the ears of some in the Westminster village. No newspaper would touch it. They wouldn't dare print it for, for fear of being sued. And indeed, the, the establishment tended to close ranks about these things. So um, uh, many people regarded this sort of behaviour as morally repugnant long after it was decriminalised in 1967. Give Thorpe his due, uh, he always said it should be decriminalised. He wasn't like some people who are hypocrites who were being actively gay in private, but then vociferously denouncing homosexualism. So uh, he tried to put pay to these rumours. He married a woman um, who was to be his bride, Caroline Allpass, who was a bit of a fag hag. Agreeable young lady. Um, was she unaware of Trump's, of not Trump's, <laughs> of Thorpe's true inclinations? There was a paralepsis. Anyway, it seems that he married her chiefly to allay suspicions about his uh, proctological proclivities, as well as to uh, give a fillip to his party's electoral fortunes. Anyway, he was never one who was shy of the limelight, and he had his wedding reception in Lambeth Palace Gardens, because despite supposedly being a radical, um, he uh, was very much into kowtowing to the establishment. Uh, he was an ardent monarchist, and his sartorial style was very much atavistic. Uh, it seemed to be like a Tory of the most reactionary cast of mind, with his black silk, silk top hats, morning suits and such like. Anyway, a child was delivered of Thorpe's wife. Um, so Thorpe manages to win over Jack Haywood, who's a key figure in this story, a British multimillionaire resident of the Bahamas. Despite being um, a, a passionate right-winger, he was very much uh, taken in by Thorpe. He fell under his spell. Thorpe had such élan vital and the sort of charisma that Haywood believed was lacking in other British politicians. So for the um, perpetually cash-strapped Liberal Party, um, Jack Haywood was manna from heaven, just the sort of sugar daddy for which they'd been praying. 
so thought bet the bank on the 1970 election, and it was a cataclysm. Despite gimmicks with huge rallies and hovercraft and so on, the party actually lost seats. Just after that, Thorpe's wife dies. Uh, so he won many false, he wore many false faces, Thorpe, but I think anyone doubts that uh, his um, grief over his wife's um, untimely death was absolutely genuine. He later married uh, Marion Steen, an Austrian Jewess, uh, who'd come to Britain as a teenage refugee, married the Earl of her Harewood, the Queen's cousin. Later they divorced, so he marries Marion Steen, and that was that. So uh, is the 70s when the Liberals may, maybe seem to have an in, because there's a deep dissatisfaction with Labour and the Conservatives, the two major parties, and the Liberals were attracting a lot of support from trendy young people with their anti-apartheid campaign, Stop the 70, Hain the Pain, Peter Hain was a young liberal trying to disrupt the South African rugby tour because of South Africa's racist policies. Um, but uh, on the other hand, the liberals were not into problem solving and firm action. They were more into triangulation, moderation and so on, rather than sometimes you can't sit in the fence, you've got to go either left or right. But in the 70s, Norman Joseph surfaced again. He changed his name by default to Norman Scott. He went to Thorpe's North Dow Devon constituency and regaled whoever was willing to listen with his um, uh, dirty stories, this um, sordid and uh, depressing tale of his relationship with Thorpe. And young conservatives would turn up at um, Thorpe's rallies and subject him to queer bashing abuse. But the other candidates decided wouldn't stoop to using Joseph's story. It could be false, and plus it just wasn't the done thing. It was ungentlemanly to use this against Thorpe. So Thorpe was what, as a wit's end, Norman Scott, also called Joseph, was a problem that simply refused to go away. And that's when he began muttering about murder. Anyway, um, so then a lot of the book becomes about this murder plot and his fixation with Thorpe reached a pathological stage. Was a hitman hired? Anyway, I won't go into the particulars of the actual hit, which gang awry, but Scott's sh dog was shot dead, but the homo sapien homo uh, was not shot. So this uh, came to reach the ears of the police, and K-9-0 side, um, I suppose, is a crime. It's somebody else's property. So Andrew Newton, the man who killed the dog, served three years in prison for killing Rinker, but also discharging a weapon with intention to endanger life, as in human life. So the affair became public because of Newton's trial. Norman Scott told his whole tale from the witness box, and because it was told in a court, the press could report it. So the solids hit the whirly thing, Stories about the, his physical relationship with Thorpe. So Thorpe denied having any intimate relationship with him, said, yes, I met him for years ago. So the tailors re related very effectively about how Trump was eventually, not Trump, Thorpe was eventually pressurised into standing down as liberal leader. Um, he was ar arrested in relation to an attempted murder plot of his one-time paramour. However, he never confirmed that he did indeed have a physical relationship with Norman Scott, as in Norman Joseph. So um, it did not play well on the doorstep for the Liberals, and he went on trial. Quite extraordinary, the leader of a major party standing trial for attempted murder. He was defended by his Oxford um, confrere, George Carman. Um, anyway, so uh, he was indicted for this, and there were some co-defendants. So it was the trial of the century, in a sense, at the Old Bailey. That's uh, England and Wales' main criminal court in London. The prosecution's case was fairly strong. They had three witnesses to the murder plot. They had all these unex unexplained payments, were well, these payments to an assassin. So the judge could not have been more flagrantly sympathetic to the defence and uh, made no attempt to conceal his disdain and disbelief in the uh, prosecu prosecution's testimony. His summing up did not so much nudge the jury as shove them towards the defence. So Trump had, not Trump, Thorpe had been eagerly anticipating testimony in his own defence, licking his lips at the chance to deliver the speech of his life. And there was going to be no better stage than this. However, his um, defence counsel told him in no uncertain terms, you will keep shtum, because the irrepressibly loquacious Thorpe could have talked his way to a life sentence. Um, anyway, the jury took some days to consider their verdict before acquitting the defendants on all charges. So uh, Thorpe walks free. So it is a uh, brilliant and um, a riveting biography. The dialogue is drawn from the reminiscences of Norman Scott, and that's Norman Joseph, um, his memoirs, and that Peter Bessel, that former Liberal MP 
who was a staunch ally of Thorpe who fell out of with him over this murder plot. The narrative necessarily leans towards their version of events because Thorpe's policy was to say as little as possible. Um, so he, they testified that Thorpe did not. Now, there is a superabundance of evidence that Thorpe had an intimate relationship with Norman Scott, um, despite denying it, and his fervent denials very much undermine his credibility. Thorpe's the devil in your ear. He's also an inveterate liar, but in some ways he's a very alluring character. Um, but it's hard to believe they would make um, up a murder plot out of nothing. Was it at least a plot to frighten Norman Scott? Um, if not kill him, just say silence or death, or we're going to kill your dog, and if you don't shut up, it'll be you next. Um, because maybe that's what the, the words were, Andrew Newton's words, you're next, not meaning I'm going to kill you this moment, but if you don't stop retailing this story about your intimate relationship with Thorpe, you'll be killed. So Thorpe was free, but a broken man, and only five years earlier, he'd stood a good chance of being in a coalition government, being foreign secretary, but his career was ruined, and that was that. Um, and he was out of politics, the Liberal Party wouldn't touch him. They'd received a donation of £10,000 from Jack Hayward in the early 70s. £10,000 was a very tidy sum in the early 70s, especially for the perennially broke Liberal Party. And Thorpe gave three totally contradictory accounts of what he did with the money. Was it lining his own pockets? Or more likely, was it used to pay an assassin? That was a king's ransom. So um, Thorpe then had to be very laconic on public affairs ever after, um, and they, he was not wanted at the Liberal Party conference. He was spoken of as possibly being director of the British section of Amnesty International, but Amnesty International rece received um, bags of furious posts about it, so the job offered to Thorpe was withdrawn. Um, he was as much of a fantasist as his arch enemy, uh, Norman Scott, it seems. He then began uh, this lugubrious descent into Parkinson's in the mid-1980s and made very few public appearances. He ought to have tread the boards because he would have been a star turn as a pantomime dame. The, the great line I would have written for him in any pantomime was, I've had people shot for less, or tried to, or just have him shooting a dog or something like that. So um, he was certainly prepossessing, self-possessed, a gay gadfly. Um, uh, I think he was he was a barrel of laughs, but obviously you wouldn't trust him as far as you could throw him. The uh, book is uh, fabulously written. Uh, it is, it's gorgeous prose. It's as enthralling as the subject matter that it describes occasionally the longsomeness of the toing and froing about the blackmail plot slowed the book down too much. But this pedestrianism is a small price to pay for such accuracy. The dialogue and the facial expressions and the tone of voices tones of voice that describe, add vividness to, the, to this tale. And Thorpe is somebody who was um, brimming over with vivacity. Um, a modicum of artistic license must be allowed to the author in order to make this uh, book just so animated. Otherwise, it could have ended up as being a rather desiccated text. Uh, so it's an eminently uh, readable book, and I give it my warmest recommendation.